we all kind of know this. Well, if we're over a certain age anyway, we kind of know this, that if you ask anybody older than you, right? So think of someone older than you. If you ask anybody older than you, they're going to tell you that the older that they have gotten, the more time seems to speed up, right? The faster time seems to go by. I personally have found that to be true. How about you guys? Is that, is that true? <laughs> Such a serious stare. <laughs> you know, but if you, if you think about time, right? Because we're going into New Year's, right? I think time is kind of weird. I mean, to me, it seems a little weird because like when you're a kid, right? And you're going somewhere. Like I remember we would go to, we would travel. We would go to grandma's house, right? It would take, when I was little, it would take about two hours to go from La Crosse to Rochester back in the days when the speed limit was 55. And I was one of those kids sitting back on the hump. Like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Like every five minutes. I was one of those kids, right? And when you're a kid, time just seems to drag on and on and on. But then when you're on this side of life, it's gone in a whiff. And we're here today, and it's the verge of 2020-24. It's like, how'd that happen? How did we even get to Christmas? And now we're beyond Christmas, and it's, and it's almost the new year. We're going into an election year. I mean, how did that happen, right? And on the same thread, have you ever noticed that there are days, right, when, and it doesn't matter how old you are, where the clock, like the minutes and the hours seem to be stretched out, and it doesn't matter how busy you are or how bored you are, there are days when it seems like the day doesn't ever end, and then there are days, again, no matter if you're really busy or you're really bored, where the time just is like, woof, it's gone. To me, it's just weird, Right? Time is a weird thing. This weekend, as we're getting ready to say goodbye to 2023, at least those of us in the Western world, we're going to explore a concept called the fullness of time. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. It's something that gets talked about sometimes just in life in general and passing. It's a concept in the Bible. And I don't know if it's a coincidence or not. I really don't believe in coincidences personally, but... There's only two passages in the entirety of the whole Bible that speak to the fullness of time, at least in those exact wording. And one of those was chosen by theologians decades ago to be among those chosen in this weekend's liturgical readings. And as I began to think about that, I kind of wondered, is it possible that God orchestrated it in such a way that he matched up the Julian calendar with the liturgical calendar in such a way that he would speak about the fullness of time? And if he did, what's that saying? But because time is ticking, no pun intended, let's just jump in. Let's dig in. If you have a Bible handy, I'd like to encourage you, open it up. We're going to go back to our second lesson for today, to a Galatians Chapter 4, we're going to start out in verses 4 through 5. We're not going to be in all of it, just a few verses here and there. And we hear this from the New Living Translation, which we heard from earlier. It says, but when the time, when the right time came, God sent a son born of a woman subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. It's worded okay, but it, for me, that's, it's, I like the New Living Translation because it's, it, it's, it's fluid with our, the way we speak English in our country, but it's not quite precise enough. I like the precision that we get from the English Standard Version, which says this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent a son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. In the English Standard Version, in the more literal text, probably maybe even the King James, I don't know, we read of this idea of the fullness of time. And again, maybe you've heard of that before, but maybe you're quite like, you're not quite fully sure. What does that mean? What, what is this concept of the fullness of time? I understand it a little bit more like this. I don't remember if I've told this story in the past. If I have, just indulge me. 
Years ago, when I was working at North Heights Lutheran Church, I don't remember what year seminary was at. I just remember working full-time at the church. I was sitting in my office, and I had this window looking out onto Rice Street. Rice Street was a busy, a busy road that, that went all the way from the north part of St. Paul all the way down to the south part of St. Paul, four-lane road, two to three times as busy as 183. You had to play Frogger if you ever wanted to go across the street, which I had to do every day. And I'm sitting there looking out my window. I don't even remember what I was working on that day, but in class, in seminary, I was studying, um, we were studying the concept of soteriology, which is the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I was pondering in my brain, I, I couldn't get this thought out of my brain, of how could Jesus die at one point in time in history for all people in the past and all people in the future. And I was really racking my brain with it. I just couldn't process it. I couldn't quite figure it out. No matter how much I read. So I'm sitting there just thinking about this, staring out my window into this gaze, watching the cars go by. To my left, which would have been south of me, there was a street light about a block and a half down. Across the street was the church. Down the road, some shopping plazas, whatever. And as I'm watching the cars go by, I hear this voice that said, where'd that car go? Huh? I hear, where'd that car go? Okay, God, I'll play along. Which car? The white one. Where'd that white car go? I don't know, God, down the road? He said, no, where's the car? And I said, probably at the red light, probably at the stoplight. And he said, okay, where is the car in relation to time? And I really had to think about it, and I'm like, well, the car is now in my past. And he said, exactly. He said, before you saw that car cross across your window, where was the car? And I said, the car was in my future. And he said, when you saw that car go by, where was it? I said, the car was my, my present. And he said, right. He said, how about for the driver? Okay, God, now I'm really having to think. And I said, that for the driver, I said, the car is in the ever present, in the ever present future moving forward. And he said, exactly, as it is for the cross of Christ. And what God was trying to explain to me as it flushed out over a period of weeks was that, and it's not literally this, but it was as though in this fullness concept of time, in this concept of time that we think that we understand, that Jesus for people is always on the cross, always coming off the cross, always going into the tomb, and always coming out of the tomb. And we know in reality that's not the case, right? Jesus died at one fixed point in time in history. He went to the cross on one fixed point in time in history, and for three hours hung on that cross. He died literally at one exact point in time in history. And then they buried him in the tomb. And three days later, he rose again at one fixed point in time in history, right? We know that. We understand that. But in this concept of fullness of time, time operates a little bit differently. What God was trying to show me is that when, when we accept Jesus Christ, whenever that is in our lives, it's as though that we are transported to the foot of the cross where we are with Christ and we die to our sins. And it's as though that we are in that tomb with Christ when we are dead to our sins and as though we are coming out of the tomb with Christ when he is resurrected and we are given new life in him. That's what God was trying to show me in a, in a, in a matter of concept that I, my brain could, could understand. And, and I wrote about that in a, my thesis paper for that class. And my professor said, you're really on to something. You should flush it out a little bit more. But what does that really mean for us? Because this is kind of heady, right? It's kind of a mind trip. 
What it really gets down to is it means that our creator knows everything about us. He knows everything about you at every single point in time in your life, well before he created time. He knew that every breath that you would ever take, he knew every move you would make, he knew that every bond or every vow you would break, and he knew every step you would take. I'm quoting lyrics here from from the police, from Sting. He knew you before he even designed the dimension of time. And he knew the exact day and the exact moment in fixed time that you would decide in your heart that you believed in Jesus and that you acknowledged him as your Lord and Savior, that you were a sinner, and that only through him could you be saved from your sins and be given everlasting right life. God knew that exact place and that exact time in our fixed history that that was going to happen well before he ever created the dimension of time, well before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. What this is saying is that in the fullness of time, God made you his own through Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul says as much in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 4, Paul talked about how God knew you. He predestined you in Christ before the creation or the foundation of the world. And God told Jeremiah, that he knew Jeremiah before he even formed him in his mother's womb. Long before Jeremiah was formed in his mother's womb, the father knew him. And if that's true for Jeremiah, it means it's true for you too. We've heard these passages before, probably even a couple times over the last year. But if you think about that and you think about all these things and this concept of a fullness of time, because nothing escapes God, God knew that today, on this date, December 31st, 2023, that you would be sitting here in the sanctuary this day, listening to this message or at some other late listening online. It's kind of like a heavenly synchronicity, if you will. Ultimately, what the fullness of time really boils down to is that when the time was just right, in in the fullness of time, when the conditions were just as the Lord God Father needed him, he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to be born and to live among us as a human being, to be completely like us in every way, shape, or form except one. He was without the stain of sin. And in the fullness of time, when it was just right, God sent his son to the cross to save us from our sins. And so that Christ could become the Christ. So that some 1900 plus years later, when the conditions were just right in your life, that God could orchestrate the events in your life in order to bring you to the foot of the cross to free you of your sins and to give you everlasting life. That is what this concept of the fullness of time means. God is working everything out for your salvation. In the fullness of time, God redeemed you. That's what Paul said. But that's not all. Because also in the same fullness of time as Paul continued, God chose to reside within you Because he knew your heart was for him long before your heart ever even began to beat. Paul continued to the church in Galatia. Now verse 6, he said, And because we are his children, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to cry out, Abba, Father. So in other words, and because we are his children, God sent his spirit of a son in the fullness of time, right? We hear this concept of the fullness of time, and you hear this duplication of words God sent. It means that fullness of time is also being repeated. In the fullness of time, God decided to take up residency in our hearts. And that allows us, that gives us the ability to cry out, Ah, the Father. What is that really saying? It's really saying that God sent the Spirit of His Son, Jesus, so that you can commune with your heavenly Daddy every moment of your life. Abba, Father, means Daddy. It doesn't just mean God, Father. It does mean that. It really means Daddy as in 
Listen, daddy up. Mama, dada, as your children once said to you, as your grandchildren say unto you, as we once said to our parents and grandparents. Before God ever laid out the foundation of time, He chose you to make you His own, to be one with you, for your heavenly spirit to be in synchrony with His spirit. He did that so your heart would beat in time with His heart and that your thoughts would then be harmonized with His thoughts. See, He didn't just want to redeem you and reside within you. No, He wanted to even go further because He wanted to unite your spirit with His. And in my opinion, there is a certain comfort in that. Because in the fullness of time, God will restore all things. We're all human, right? We all sometimes fret about this, that, or the other thing. We all tend to worry. We have anxieties. We have problems. We have troubles. Those things don't care what year it is, what month or day it is. And we know that we can't change the past. And we don't know what lies around the corner either. We don't know what next year is going to bring. We don't know if 2024 is going to be our best year yet as people, as individuals, as businesses, as a congregation, as a country, whatever have you, right? We don't know what the world's going to bring. It could be our best year yet or it could be troubles with the like which we've never seen before. We just don't know, right? So we therefore, we, we make plans, right? We try our best to make plans. But yet at the end of the day, as, as we hear about in the Proverbs, the Lord determines our steps. If you're also anything like me, you probably have some regrets that you would wish you could go back and change. Anybody like that? Things that you wish you could have done differently? But have you ever wondered if I did something differently? If I, if I went back and I did this differently or I did that differently, what would be the result? I've often thought, you know, I don't know if I'd want to go back and do that second enlistment. Maybe I'd just gotten out after my first four years. But if I had done that, I don't know if I would have ended up marrying Danielle. And if Danielle and I never got married, Haley would have never come along. And then, and then Grace would have never been either. And I'm thinking, I don't think I'd trade all my mistakes in the world if I couldn't be married to my wife and have the three daughters that I do. If we could change the past, we don't know what would happen. Right? So there's no point even regretting the past. I guess what I'm trying to say is this, that if you believe that Jesus Christ redeemed you and the Spirit now resides you because of the fullness of time, then there's really no need to really worry about what the new year may bring, right? Because in the fullness of time, as the second passage that Paul used in the whole of the Bible... God talked about how he's going to unite all things under Jesus Christ in heaven and earth. Though it's something that hasn't wholly happened yet. Not all things under heaven and earth have been united under Christ yet. That means that in time, God is going to restore all things, like making it eat and all over again. And that is something, in my humble opinion, that we are all to look forward to. Something new that God is going to do in the fullness of time, when time is just right. But as that boils down for you and me, and the way we think about our own lives, what this really gets down to is that not one moment in your life is ever unseen by God. Not one. So if that's true, we really don't need to worry about anything. We don't need to worry about what to put on our back or what to eat, where we're going to live, how much money we have or don't have. We don't need to worry what's going on in the political climate of the world or any of those things. We just need to rest and be with God in the fullness of His time. Our heart with His heart. Our mind to His mind. Beating in heavenly synchronicity. Because again, He knows every step we're going to take, every move we're going to make. He knows the last breath that we'll take. And he knows every vow that we will or will not break. So if that's the case, 
why not then just rededicate ourselves to the Lord this year and say, oh, Father God, let my heart and my mind beat with yours. Let me trust in you all the more this coming year, Father God, and let me just rest and be with you in heavenly synchronicity. He's already ordained your days. He knows everything about you. So this coming year, I'm not going to ask you to do anything hard. Just give yourselves a little bit more to the Lord. Rest in Him. Pray to Him more. Let your heart beat in synchronicity with His. And let His thoughts become your thoughts. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, time is a weird thing, at least for us here on this earth. It comes, it goes, and yet we still are. We thank you that in the fullness of time you saved us at the problem of the cross of Christ. We thank you that in the fullness of time that you have given us new life in Christ. We thank you that in the fullness of time that you put your spirit within us to commune with you so our hearts beat as yours and so that your thoughts can become ours. And we know in the fullness of time, Father God, that you will come back and gather us to be with you where you are. So then why do we need to worry about a thing? Help us to all in this coming year, Father God, trust you all the more, no matter what the days will bring. And in that, the new year shall certainly be great because we are yours. Bless every friend of mine in this congregation, whether here or not this day. Bless them all, Father God. Bless their families and their friends in this community in which we live. May our heart beat with yours. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.